investigators race to stop a serial bomber who sends his deadly parcels by mail. Three people have been killed, and no one knows how many more packages are en route to their targets. In California, experts match wits with a terrorist bent on crippling the Internal Revenue Service. For five years, his bombs have confounded authorities. Sheer luck has prevented injuries, but sheer skill is what's needed to catch him. Beneath the rubble, the terrorist leaves a calling card that experts are learning to read. In bomb investigations, forensics means the difference between feeling safe and living in terror. the terrorist's greatest ally. To achieve his ends, he doesn't care who dies. He can strike anywhere, anytime. And though his crimes are carefully plotted, their effect seems horribly random. When bombs are his weapon of choice, he can kill from a distance. In Birmingham, Alabama, two weeks before Christmas, 1989, Helen Vance accepted a package addressed to her husband, Robert. Federal Judge Robert Vance came in from his yard work to find the package on the table where his wife was wrapping gifts. Believing it contained magazines he'd been waiting for, he cut the string and opened the box. was killed instantly. When paramedics arrived on the scene, they tried to help Helen Vance, who was standing nearby when the bomb exploded. She was temporarily deafened from the blast and in shock, unable to speak. Forensic experts rushed to the scene to investigate. They collected nails embedded in the walls and ceiling, shards of steel pipe, and the remnants of the package itself. The explosion had hurled the shrapnel up to 3,600 miles per hour. Each fragment was carefully catalogued. Only the most meticulous work would allow authorities to catch a killer who struck from a distance. And that killer wasn't stopping. 150 miles away in Atlanta, two days after Judge Vance was killed, a package arrived at the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, addressed to the clerk's office. A routine x-ray revealed the ominous silhouette of a pipe bomb. Before the shocked security officers could stop it, the package dropped to the floor. The officers immediately evacuated the building and called bomb technicians. An alert posted after the death of Judge Vance described the device that killed him. The Atlanta bomb resembled the one in Birmingham. Though Vance's bomb was rigged to explode when the package was opened, the bomb techs had to assume this one could blow at any moment. The drop from the conveyor belt and routine handling in the post office could have rendered it unstable. Their Kevlar suits, three inches thick and weighing 80 pounds, provide safety only at a distance. 
If the tech is close to the detonation, the pressure from the blast would crush him. The first step was to photograph and x-ray the bomb to study its components. The x-rays revealed no timing device, so the techs breathed a little easier. I think the switch gonna be all right. we know the bomb there was no reason to rush. Unless a bomb is rigged to a timer or strapped to a victim, bomb removal typically takes hours. Every step was planned, every motion rehearsed. As each maneuver was carefully completed, the bomb techs paused to ventilate their smothering suits and modify their strategy. As a precaution, the area around the building was kept clear of pedestrians and traffic. Throughout the delicate operation, their hands remained uncovered to assure they kept a secure grip. Once they were certain the bomb was stable, they lowered it into a bin and put it in an armored trailer. Police cars and motorcycles cleared a safe area around the vehicle. The convoy took the least populated route to the bomb range at the city landfill. The package was rendered safe, but this second bomb in two days had enormous impact. It suggested a serial bomber. Alcohol, tobacco, and firearms special agent Brian Hoback was assigned to the case. You got to remember who the targets were. One, a judge, a federal judge. Two, people at the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals who had nothing to do with the judicial system other than administrative matters. But the bomber wasn't through. On December 18th, the same day the Atlanta bomb was deactivated, attorney Robbie Robinson received a package in Savannah, 250 miles away. Like Judge Vance, Robinson had no reason to suspect anything sinister about the package sitting on his desk a week before Christmas. In an instant, he became the killer's second victim. Investigators mapped out the direction of the explosion to better estimate the size of the bomb. They set up a grid and began the tedious task of collecting even the tiniest shreds of evidence. When investigators go to a crime scene, they're looking for physical evidence. Uh, that evidence in a bombing scene is everywhere. It's on the ceilings, it's on the ground, it's in the walls, it's in uh, the furniture, it's, on the it's in the victim's body, it's on the victim's clothing. First we photograph, then we grid the room so that we know exactly where that piece of evidence came from and we can articulate that to a jury. We got down on our hands and knees uh, and collected that evidence, sifted it, uh, stick it over a screen, shake the, uh, the debris to see if we can't find components of whatever the device was that uh, exploded. In that particular case, it was a pipe bomb inside of a cardboard box. One of the more insidious aspects of the bomb was the fact that dozens of nails seen here in x-rays of the victim's body were packed around the pipe increasing the deadliness of the explosion. These nails matched those from Judge Vance's bomb and the package intercepted at the courthouse in Atlanta. The wrapping, found almost intact in Robinson's trash can, was also comparable to the other bombs. With three bombs in two days, 
time was precious. Agent Hoback and his multi-agency team struggled to find a link between the three targets. Why would someone single out this particular lawyer, judge, and court building? The bombing seemed like random strikes against the legal system. If that were true, the bomber would be hard to predict and harder to catch. They couldn't anticipate who the next victim might be, and it was likely that the bomb was already in the mail. This shot is peeled backwards on that. In the lab, experts studied the nails, pieces of pipe, bits of wire, and package remnants collected from the exploded bombs. They took inventory of the most minute details. Barely perceptible markings, fragments of logos, tiny pieces of packaging, all may lead to manufacturers or retail outlets or directly to a killer. But in this case, the items surviving the blast were too generic to tell them anything. The bomber continued with his deadly plan. Fortunately, Jacksonville, Florida NAACP President Willie Dennis was too busy to open her mail on December 18th. Learning of Robinson's death in Savannah and warned by her friends to be wary of any packages, she called her secretary the next day to advise him not to open the parcel on her desk. What she later did was call the sheriff's department down there in Jacksonville and requested them to look at a package that to her seemed somewhat suspicious. The technicians noted it was identical to packages used in the previous bombings. They photographed and x-rayed it to see if their suspicions were justified. You got power supply, you got wires going into an unknown dense substance. The x-rays disclosed a device that matched the other bombs, so investigators had the advantage of knowing what they were dealing with. The technicians used a mechanical device to disable its firing system. The package had been successfully ripped apart. Still wary of an explosion, technicians carefully pulled the unexploded pipe bomb from the office while maintaining a cautious distance. It was brought to a bomb range, studied, rendered safe, and carefully dismantled. Left behind in the office were the now familiar nails and brown paper with red and white mailing labels. Like most mail bombers, this one affixed more than enough postage to assure his package was delivered. This parcel also contained something surprising, a roll of hate mail. It included a copy of a threatening letter sent to a Jacksonville television station. The postmark linked it to an Atlanta post office. So now the agents knew the bomb was probably sent from Georgia. The physical evidence was building. These strongly worded letters put right-wing fringe groups high on the list of suspects. The ATF assembled a task force to outsmart the bomber. Terry Pelfrey, a bomb technician with the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, was called into the group's monthly lunch meeting. My role in the investigation was to first look at right-wing groups that were located in Georgia. These included the Ku Klux Klan, the Aryan Nation members, Christian Identity Church Movement members, and skinheads. We had informants in each of these groups. Uh, some of the informants ranked as high as Grand Dragons in these groups, which, are, which were the leaders of the Ku Klux Klan. There, were no t there was no talk within the right-wing movement groups that, that would give us any indication of, of bomb suspects in these groups. 
At the December 19th meeting, an ATF agent outlined the similarities among the recent bombing incidents. After considerable effort, did you uh, see anything you recognize? He passed around pictures of the bomb recovered at the courthouse and described what he knew of its construction. The device consists of a pipe bomb with flat welded end plates. The description struck a spark of recognition for ATF bomb expert Lloyd Irwin. The bombs resembled one he saw in 1972. Though he had inspected more than 3,000 bombs in his career, he had a feeling this was the work of the same bomber. The minute I looked at it, I saw some characteristics of this bomb that reminded me of the 1972 bomb. That being that it had square end plates held with a bolt through the center. Only had one bolt, but still, it was the same technique. How about uh, drawing me a picture? He hadn't seen another like it in more than 15 years. From memory, Irwin sketched the 1972 bomb. You learned that the guy, even though he changes his technique, if he's made them before, he'll usually he'll keep something similar because he knows it worked before. Why trash it when he can make it work again? So he might modify it, but he'll still have some similarities of something that he's done before. Did we get him? For Irwin, the construction of the devices bore the signature of the 1972 bomber. Right after the meeting, he called Special Agent Hoback. So Lloyd Irwin called me back at the office to advise me that he had seen only one other device like this in all the years that he had been involved in these types of investigations, and he gave me the name of the man who had been convicted of possessing that device in 1972. That man's name was Walter Leroy Moody. Roy Moody had been convicted of building a bomb he intended to send to the man who had repossessed his car. The bomb's real victim, however, was Moody's wife, Hazel, who inadvertently opened the package, injuring her hand and eye and severely burning her face. Roy Moody went to prison, and Hazel was granted a divorce. The ATF began taking a closer look at Roy Moody. We eliminate suspects by uh, different things. Motive might be uh, one way to eliminate them whether their presence was actually in the area. Uh, there's a number of ways to eliminate suspects. However, what we were doing with other suspects by eliminating them, uh, we could not do with Walter Leroy Moody. At this point, most of the evidence linking Moody to the bombings was circumstantial. The investigators now had to positively link the components of the bombs to the suspected bomber. For that, they relied on the ATF forensics lab in Atlanta. By analyzing the chemical composition of the detonators and primers, experts determined who manufactured them. Fortunately, the company had very limited distribution in the Southeast. The manufacturer provided a list of the stores that sold their product. Meanwhile, the ATF noted further similarities between Moody's 1972 bomb and the recent ones. All used cardboard boxes, metal pipes with square end caps and a rod, flashlight batteries, and flashlight bulbs. So investigators would have more first-hand information, specialists recreated and detonated the bombs. When powder packed inside a sealed pipe is ignited, it quickly converts from solid to gas. The resulting pressure is enormous. In an instant, the pipe bursts, sending razor-sharp fragments of steel and nails in all directions at deadly speed. Whoever built these bombs went to great lengths to maximize their destructive power. They were made for only one purpose, to kill. 
A behavioral profile described the killer as a white male, working and living alone or with one other person, disciplined, educated, self-structured, meticulous, and cowardly. He believed his current job was beneath him. Presented with that profile, Terry Pelfrey recognized the precise description of the man he had been investigating, Roy Moody. Bill Hagmeyer uh, with the FBI did the psychological profiling. Um, he did not know Walter Leroy Moody at all. Uh, he, and, and so I sat during the uh, meetings uh, with Mr. Hagmeyer. He, he read the psychological profile that he had written up, and he wrote Mr. Moody's life story in that profile. Um, it was really rather scary. The weight of the combined evidence was enough to obtain a search warrant. On February 8th, investigators searched Moody's house. They uncovered law books and transcripts of Moody's 1972 bomb trial. As we found in his transcripts during this search warrant, the highlighted areas where we matched forensically the evidence from the explosive site to the evidence that, found, uh, that was found within his home in his workshop, all that matched in 1972. So in 1989, Mr. Moody gets smarter. He thinks he gets smarter. But it was the clues detectives failed to find that raised their suspicions further. We knew that Mr. Moody kept his books from school because he had his law books. However, he didn't have his chemistry books. We also did not find the weapons that uh, uh, apparently Mr. Moody owned. Uh, we knew he owned some because he had ammunition in the front seat of his pickup truck. So where were those weapons? Following a lead, investigators secured permission to search the basement of a house in Shambly, Georgia, where Moody rented storage space. They found a pipe with caps screwed onto each end. The caps had holes drilled through them, and one of the ends had a nut welded atop it, ready for a rod to be threaded through. One of the investigators on the scene was ATF Special Agent David Heitch. All ATF agents are trained in our basic school to identify improvised explosive devices, and the most basic and most commonly used improvised explosive device in this country is a pipe bomb. And so when you see a pipe nipple with end caps affixed, I automatically think that potentially we've got a pipe bomb. Heitch took the pipe to chemist Lloyd Irwin, who suspected Roy Moody's handiwork early in the investigation. Irwin scraped the pipe in search of explosive residue. His analysis yielded only rust. The pipe may have been a prototype, but agents had no way to prove it. They just didn't have enough to make their case. In their search for more evidence in the mail bombings, investigators went to stores that sold the brand of primers used in the bombs. Their hunt led them to the Shootin' Iron Gun Shop in Griffin, Georgia. An employee remembered selling a four-pound keg of red dot smokeless powder and 4,000 handgun primers in December of 1989. The large purchase stuck in his mind. Red dot was the powder used in the December bombs and 3,200 primers were needed to fire them. In a photo lineup, the clerk chose Roy Moody as the customer. Investigators felt they had their man. On July 10, 1990, Roy Moody was arrested and held without bail. Police also brought into custody his wife, Susan, as a possible accomplice. She was permitted a bond. 
Susan Moody was allowed to plead guilty to a lesser charge of conspiracy in exchange for her complete cooperation. She told investigators how she had been a servant to Roy almost since the day they met in 1981. She said Roy taught her to cover her trail, use disguises, buy materials, and mail packages far from home. She also offered the name of Roy's former cellmate. When investigators searched his house, they found footlockers with Moody's name on them. They contained the missing guns and chemistry books. Agents also found ammunition, a bomb diagram, and an arc welding unit. Susan Moody's testimony was crucial to cracking the case. She pretty much put everything together for us. We had bits and pieces all throughout the investigation of why Moody did this, how he did this, uh, to what extent he did the uh, he did the bombings the same uh, way that he did in 1972 as far as their construction. However, Mrs. Moody actually told us how he went about the process and how the process began with the motive. And what was that motive? Roy Moody had a history of frivolous litigation. Most of his cases were thrown out of court. He was desperate to become a lawyer so he could fix what he considered to be a flawed system. But he was denied the bar exam because of his 1972 felony conviction for creating the bomb that injured his first wife. When he failed to have the conviction overturned, Moody swore revenge against the judicial system. He started with Judge Robert Vance, who had written an opinion denying his appeal. Moody was caught through dedicated investigative work, detailed forensics, and the sharp memory of bomb investigator Lloyd Irwin. We have a computer system at ATF that matches up bomb components, and it's a very valuable computer system, and we're continuously refining that computer system. It's amazing what it can do. It, you can enter the, the components you have from a device, and it will tell you if there have ever been any similar devices constructed. Well, in this particular case, Lloyd beat the computer. I mean, there's, there's no substitute for experience like Lloyd has. The legal system that Roy Moody felt had failed him did not fail the citizens he terrorized. In June 1991, the jury sentenced him to seven life terms plus 400 years, later changed to the death penalty. Moody's twisted agenda relied on the U.S. mail to deliver his bombs to specific people. But other terrorists are not so particular about who they murder. The Oklahoma City bombing was thought to be a strike against government. In the process of destroying the building, 168 citizens were killed. When a terrorist targets the government, there's no predicting how or when he'll attack. In the early morning hours of February 22, 1990, the West Los Angeles Fire Department answered a routine call to douse a burning truck around the corner from their station. But this was no standard vehicle fire. The truck, parked in front of an office building, contained five 55-gallon barrels and clusters of pipes in its bed all tilted toward the building. The pipes were improvised mortars designed to lob pipe bombs. Some had already launched. To keep the barrels from rupturing, firefighters used gentle pressure to cool them and extinguish the fire. Bomb technicians were called in. Members of the Los Angeles Police Department bomb squad rushed to the scene. As they suited up, firefighters explained what they had found. 
Bomb Squad Detective Joe Powell realized that a huge catastrophe was narrowly averted. The fire department described that the drums were uh, cherry red hot because of the fire, and they put the fire out with the uh, water hose that they normally use. The fire department was extremely lucky that the device did not detonate on them when they were putting the fire out. Powell's primary concern was to be sure there were no secondary devices, so he checked the fifth floor where windows had been broken by the homemade mortar rounds. The bombs penetrated the office of the IRS, which occupied the fifth floor, but damage was minimal. Then he and his partner cautiously approached the truck. They needed to determine whether the truck was booby-trapped, since their first priority is to keep people from getting hurt. Once the area was evacuated, we went up and took individual samples out of each, in the, each drum, analyzed them at the scene visually, and then sent them back to the lab for a, for a scientific evaluation to see what the chemical structure was. The contents of the barrels were sent to the lab. Using a gas chromatograph, the samples were broken down into their chemical components. The tests determined that the substance inside the barrels was ANFO, an unstable mixture of ammonium nitrate and fuel oil. The truck contained more than 200 gallons of ANFO. To understand the destructive potential of that much explosive, the LAPD performed a test explosion in the California desert. They filled a pickup truck with a combination of ANFO and TNT to simulate the conditions at the IRS building. The truck had been obliterated. Wreckage littered the desert floor. Nothing recognizable was left behind. In an urban setting, the damage from such an explosion would have been colossal, says FBI Special Agent Nick Boone. That is almost the equivalent of 1,600 pounds of TNT. This is a high explosive. Uh, that blast would have gone out in, in all directions and done extreme damage for many blocks. The only thing that would have made it more devastating is had this same truck been confined as if in the parking garage, the effect would have been something like Oklahoma City. In fact, the parking garage was the scene of a potential bombing less than two years earlier. In that case, too, disaster was narrowly averted. The IRS building had been the target of bombings before. In September 1988, the basement parking garage was the scene of the first incident. Detective Powell and the bomb squad disarmed a 1971 Toyota at this address. It contained a water heater filled with ANFO. It also had a booby trap under the rear tire. When tripped, the car burst into flames. As the fire department extinguished it, they found pipe bombs in the trunk. Bomb squad technicians determined that gasoline cans and plastic detergent bottles in the back seat were filled with ammonia and bleach. They were designed to fill the garage with poisonous fumes. The bombs were deactivated without incident. The car had been reported stolen from the parking lot of Ford Aerospace, but there the trail grew cold. But not for long. Six months later, a routine line check by the power company uncovered pipe bombs attached to four high-voltage power poles behind the same building. 
the bombs detonated, causing minor damage. The IRS building in West LA wasn't the bomber's only target. The power line bombs resembled one found eight months earlier, about 50 miles away. An electronic detonator and ANFO were attached to the base of a power pole servicing the IRS building in Laguna Niguel, California. It was rendered harmless by the bomb squad. It was clear the bombings were related. These attacks and bombings in other buildings dating back to 1986 led to the formation of a multi-agency task force on terrorism. It found that the circuitry in all the bombs was similar. FBI Special Agent Frank Bakhti was a case agent for the task force. All explosive devices, especially serial, serial bomber explosive devices, um, have a specific signature or type of construction unique to, to the bomb maker. And if you could examine a series of, of unexplained bombings, uh, you can examine the way the bombs are put together and make a, uh, a fairly educated guess as to whether one person might be responsible based upon the way the, the bombs are constructed. Besides the design similarities, all the bombings shared a common target, the Internal Revenue Service. We began investigating in several directions. One was to try and find other similar bombings that were committed in this area and to see who was either convicted of those bombings or suspected. We also went in the direction of states' rights, anti-government, anti-IRS groups, uh, because they would logically be the kind of people that might attack the buildings and go after IRS. A potential lead arrived in the mail. In letters sent to the newspaper and to the IRS building, a group calling itself Up the IRS Incorporated claimed responsibility for the truck bombing, as it had the 1988 car bomb attack. Boone considered the letter authentic, as it contained information about the bomb not made public. The envelopes were addressed by hand, giving investigators a writing sample but they had nothing to compare it against. A more immediately helpful clue was a digital watch used as a timing device. Investigators believe the bomber was trying to show off his high-tech skills, but to no avail. The alarm on the watch used to ignite the truck bomb wasn't set properly, so the device didn't detonate as planned. Even so, the circuitry of the bombs provided the first clear lead. Many components were built exclusively for the military and were unavailable on the street. That suggested the bomber had some contact with the high-tech industry. The fact that the car used in the garage bombing in 1988 was stolen from the parking lot at Ford Aerospace gave LAPD detective Bob Nelson an avenue to pursue. We learned later on in the investigation as we went through the components that there were certain identifiable wires and electronic components that were directly attributed to uh, the Ford Aerospace location. However, there was no estimate as to when they were actually utilized. There was no date or any way to tell if it was a, a, an old surplus item or something current. Nelson and Boone were certain the bomber was a past or present employee of Ford Aerospace. But the company employs thousands. The detectives had no way of narrowing the pool. Thanks to the swift action of the West Los Angeles Fire Department, one of the most pivotal clues was preserved. The serial number from the truck used in the 1990 bombing was traced to its last registered owners. Mr. and Mrs. Orozco had sold it for $500 in December of 1989. Okay, is it right? According to Mr. Orozco, the buyer hardly spoke, asked few questions, and seemed anxious to leave. He didn't haggle over the price, and he paid cash. 
The name he signed on the title form was James T. Harmon. Police knew that if they found Harmon, they'd find the bomber. But what did he look like? A police artist brought an identikit to the Orozcos to create a composite sketch. Oh, yeah. It was. It contains hundreds of overlays of generic facial features. By mixing and matching, the artist slowly fashioned a likeness of the suspect that the witnesses were satisfied with. An initial check with FBI, ATF, and LAPD files came up empty. In the meantime, the bomber struck again. On the morning of March 31, 1991, mortar fire buffeted the parking lot and roof of the IRS Service Center in Fresno, California. No one was hurt. The 13 missiles were launched from a vacant lot where investigators collected extension cords, wiring, and crumpled newspaper used as packing. They also picked up a digital watch timing device and aerospace circuitry. Agent Boone knew the same bomber was responsible, and he knew he and Detective Nelson were getting closer to catching him. I took one look at it, saw many of our components, and knew this is our bomber again. This is our serial bomber. But this time he slipped up, and we got the major break of the case. One of those components was a what we call a heat sink. It's simply a piece of metal that disperses heat. Boone believed the specialized component was probably made by Ford Aerospace. He needed to learn more about it, but everyone at the plant was a potential suspect. Who could he trust? Discreet inquiries about the component brought him nothing. Frustrated, getting nowhere, he showed it to the assembly engineer, taking the chance he wasn't the bomber. He walked down one corridor, turned the corner, walked down another, reached into a bin, and handed me an identical heat sink. I can't tell you what the feeling was like at that point. It was the most exciting part of, of the case ever, and I also began to look around quite concerned that I'm now standing here with the heat sink in my hand, and there's every possibility that the bomber is two tables away, is on the assembly line, is the engineer around the corner. We got out of there about as fast as we could get away from the assembly line and back off the floor. Although identifying numbers had been filed off, the components were ringed with red paint. The engineer explained that meant they were defective and pulled off the line. This considerably narrowed down the possible areas at Ford Aerospace. Only 84 of them were ever manufactured, and nine of them only had been pulled off the line as defective. So now we really had four of nine in the entire world. Hello, sir. Thanks for seeing us. Investigators brought the composite sketch to the manager of the engineering lab, the most likely source of the heat sink. The manager didn't recognize the face and didn't know a James Harmon. Who was this man? Detectives knew they were getting close, but the identity of their bomber still eluded them. How soon before he struck again? How soon before he killed someone? As their search for the bomber continued, Agent Boone and Detective Nelson received a call from the lab manager. After thinking about it, he did in fact recognize the face in the police sketch. It bore a resemblance to an engineer in the large-scale inspection lab. It looked like a man named Dean Harvey Hicks. The investigators raced back to Ford Aerospace. At his desk, they found anti-IRS cartoons, and in his employee file were writing samples that matched the handwriting on the envelopes of the letters that claimed responsibility. 
once we reached a, a part of the investigation where uh, we were at Ford Aerospace and Nick Boone pulled open the personnel file and made the comparison with the photograph and the hand printing and handwriting, and we knew that uh, Dean Harvey Hicks was our suspect. Digging deeper, agents learned that on January 17, 1990, a man named James T. Harmon purchased 700 pounds of ammonium nitrate fertilizer, the main ingredient of ANFO, at the Orange County Farm Supply Company. James T. Harmon was the name on the DMV form submitted after the purchase of the truck used in the 1990 bombing. The handwriting on the receipt matched that of Dean Harvey Hicks. Incriminating handwriting was also found at the scene of the Fresno bombing, placing Hicks at the scene. He had figured on some newspaper how far his mortar bombs would fire, how much powder would send the bomb how far, and he had worked this out on this piece of newspaper. He then wadded that up and actually used it for packing in the Fresno device. We had that also, and we straightened that out and were able to look at the numbers on a flat surface. We were able to actually also match those to his handwriting. Agent Boone and Detective Nelson tallied the evidence. Hicks had been off work when each of the bombs was planted. He had access to all of the items linked to Ford Aerospace. He matched the description of the purchaser of the truck used in 1990, and his handwriting matched the letters claiming responsibility. But detectives didn't know if he was acting alone. Before they arrested him, they kept an eye on him. Surveillance continued while the arrest warrant and search warrants were being prepared, while we looked into his past to determine whether or not there was other people involved with him. At uh, a point in the investigation, uh, we believe that there may be some interest in him constructing another device. Uh, we initiated the, the search warrant and the arrest warrant the following day. His arrest came on July 11, 1991. Hicks was brought to a hotel room for interview. There, he seemed pleased to provide details about the bombings. He especially liked to answer technical questions the investigators could not figure out. By the time we had finished the interview, uh, Dean Hicks had made a complete confession and described to us in great detail how he put together and delivered most of the bombs. He actually had some loss of recollection on some of them because it was just too long ago, but he was incredibly detailed on all of the more recent bombings, how he meticulously put them together and how he constructed them and how he delivered them to the site. While Boone and Nelson interviewed Hicks, forensics experts searched his house and garage. There, they found bombs in progress, circuits, ammonium nitrate, and false ID bearing the name of James T. Harmon. The story became very clear. His co-workers at Ford Aerospace knew that Dean Harvey Hicks despised the IRS. But they didn't know he was stealing parts from the workplace in order to attack the government agency. In 1981, Hicks had claimed an $8,500 income tax deduction, a contribution to an organization that the IRS did not consider nonprofit. It denied the deduction. Hicks claimed that the IRS employee he spoke with laughed at him, so he used his electronics expertise to exact his revenge. Though he claimed to be part of a group, the task force on terrorism determined that Hicks acted alone. Organized groups are not always responsible for acts of domestic terrorism. One person can do just as much damage uh, with a little bit of explosive knowledge as, as an entire uh, terrorist organization. And I think in the past, uh, 
we would always tend to look at the organized terrorist organizations being responsible for, for some of the acts. Uh, I think Mr. Hicks has shown everyone that, that one person acting alone can be uh, just as deadly and just as dangerous as, as a large group. As clever as Dean Harvey Hicks was, the tireless efforts of investigators like Agent Nick Boone and Detective Bob Nelson finally ended his reign of terror. Finding him guilty on four counts of using destructive devices against a federal facility, a jury sentenced Hicks to 20 years in prison. Ironically, he was also ordered to pay more than $335,000 to the Internal Revenue Service. The crimes of Dean Hicks and Roy Moody were personal vendettas disguised as political statements. Like all acts of terrorism, the senseless deeds of these desperate men accomplished nothing. Despite its mystique, terrorism is a crime like any other. And like all crimes, the perpetrator can't help but leave clues behind. With each new case, forensic detectives refine their ability to trace those clues back to the criminal.